In the following lecture on Open Innovation in the Global Economy, Mario Caforos discusses the advantages of open innovation. He provides many examples of the benefits, but he also asks an important question. Do the benefits of open innovation outweigh the disadvantages? He then makes three points to illustrate the answer to this question. I'd like to take a minute to remind to us how interconnected the global economy is and how interdependent countries, countries are. I have studied international business and innovation for many years, but I'm still very, very fascinated when I look at the data and realize the extent to which countries are interconnected. I'll put it in very, very simple terms. Other countries are our customers, we sell to them, so we depend on them buying our products and services. If they stop buying our products and services, our revenues, our stream of revenues will go down. Uh, we are, of course, at the same time, the customers for other countries. We buy their products, and some of their products, their, some of their outputs, are inputs in our processes, in our manufacturing techniques. So again, we depend on them. Of course, other countries invest in our country. They create jobs, they add to our skill set, they, in some cases, educate us, there are spillover effects, we're, learn we're learning from them, and there are certain benefits, and of course, employment goes up, one of the key benefits of attracting foreign investment. But we invest in other countries too. Yeah, and of course, given that we have investments, many MNEs have subsidiaries in many other countries, we also care, we depend on what is going on in many other countries around the world. And on top of that, what I, I don't cover on this slide, of course, especially these days, we are very globalized in our education. Especially young people like to travel, like to go to other countries and study, work for a little while, and go to another country and do the same. I've got in, in my MSc in international business some guys who are just 22, 23 years old, and some of them uh, join our degree, and they have already worked in three countries. When I was in my 20s, certainly I, I, I was very, very tied to one country. Uh, I admire this behavior, but the implication of that is that we are all, our education is also very interdependent in the global economy. Furthermore, uh, it makes less sense to talk about UK companies or German companies or US companies. Very often in international business, we use very simple indices to measure the internationalization of the firm. And two of those simple indices focus on the foreign sales of the firm over its total sales or the foreign assets of the firm over its total assets. Now, when we look at practically this data for many companies, you will see that they've got hundreds of subsidiaries abroad. And if we look at this ratio, for some of these companies, 90 or even 95% of their assets are located abroad. So yes, they, perhaps we can say a firm is headquartered in the UK or in the US, but most of its assets are spread across the world, and therefore, depending on what happens on each of these economies, there are implications that are very direct for that company. On top of that, we've got private institutional investors, including pension funds, I'll come to that in a minute, that hold shares in multinational firms across countries. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the pension system in Hong Kong, but what I can tell you with certainty, in many countries in Europe, including in the UK, what has changed in the uh, pension system is that if we go, let's say, back 30, 40, 50 years, our parents made contributions to, our, to their pension, and at the end of their working life, when they got fi finally their pension, they were expecting a stable income. I know for Hong Kong, the situation is slightly different, but 
For many countries, that is true. What has says now is that the contributions that people make to their pension funds, they are invested in stock markets and bond markets. And what these uh, pension funds say to us, depending on how well these investments will go in the future, depending on the return, that return will dictate how much money you will get uh, back at the end of your working life. So again, we depend directly, our pensions depend directly on how well these companies do. And of course, anyone who knows the first thing about portfolio theory and managing portfolio of investments, he will tell you that, well, a good portfolio has to have in it uh, investments that are not correlated or even negatively correlated. So if something goes up, perhaps the other one is not so much affected, but Certainly, we want things, if an investment goes down, not to bring down other things. We don't want many investments in the portfolio to be correlated, which means that these pension funds invest not just in one or two countries, but in many, usually multinational firms across the world. So even us as individuals and our pensions and our children will depend uh, uh, on how well not just our economy, but multiple economies are doing. So in that context of a global interdependence, going back to the issue of open innovation, and let, us, let me get us started by explaining what open innovation is in very simple terms again. It refers to a much more open model that, and it's a business model that engages much more with the market. And I'll come to what the market might include in a few minutes. I'll give you a few examples to better understand how a company might actually do it. But that's a, a, a good starting point. Yeah, a business model that engages much more with the market. Let me also emphasize the importance of engaging in open innovation. Perhaps there are some big companies, lots of resources, and say, OK, you know what? We have all these sci scientists, thousands of scientists, thousands of managers lots of resources, we can do pretty much, not everything, but a large proportion of what we would like to do, we can do internally. Well, that's not the case anymore. The iPhone is one of the incremental innovation. Yeah, we've got several models now. Perhaps the iPhone was something new when was first introduced, but now we're down to model 10. It's not something radical anymore. It's an incremental innovation. It is refined every year. But again, if we go back to that innovation, which is not even radical, I googled this morning the different components, different technologies that the iPhone worked. There are technologies needed for the uh, uh, central processing unit, the CPU. And there is a general CPU, so one set of technologies there. Then there is a CPU for the graphics. Then there is a communication chip for the GSM technologies. There is another communication chip for the Wi-Fi technologies. There are other chips for the memory, different types of memories. There are multi-touch displays, of course. There is the battery element. There are accelerometers for detecting movement. Uh, of course, on top of that, we have software, 3D recognition, and augmented reality and lots of other stuff, which when you start thinking about these things, we're talking about very different technologies. Some of them from the communication uh, uh, sector, some other technologies are coming from chemistry, for instance. And some of these technologies might appear simple, but they are not. For instance, increasing the capacity of a battery. It's not a simple issue. Yeah, and yet it's so fundamental. So many devices, not just electronic devices, these days also lots of cars are fueled by batteries. So again, for a firm engaging in all those technologies is nearly impossible. They have to be much more open and engage with very different firms that have technological capabilities in very different scientific domains. It's very interesting what what insights we can get when we look at actual patents. 
And there are patterns that are categorized into classes. But even if we get one class, and we just focus on one of the many, many hundreds of classes, then within that class, again, there are so many subcategories. And if you go and talk to scientists who work on these patterns, they don't even understand themselves patterns that are coming from the same class. So we're talking about something very, very complex, and it's imperative. There is no way for a company to do it alone. So that's our need to engage in open innovation. Let me explain a little bit more what open innovation is. Again, if we go back 20, 30, 40 years ago, business models that many firms, not all, but many firms adopted was a much more closed firms. And I've got here a, a useful table from the, the book of Henry Chesbro on open innovation that compares a little bit a more closed philosophy, a closed business model with a more open business model. And you will notice that the principles between those two models differ a lot. And some of the assumptions, especially in the closed models, can be challenged a lot. So the closed models suggest in things like that, the smart people in our field work for us. To profit from R&D, we must discover it ourselves, develop it ourselves, ship it ourselves. And if we do that, we will also get it to the market first. So it was very, very uh, focused on the firm itself and on building capabilities internally. I have to be better than you in order to win in the market, in order to bring a product to the market first. And that was the philosophy. If the company gets uh, innovation to the market first, it will win. Uh, one of the most heated races for technology in the corporate history was that between the PlayStation and Xbox. And these firms were very focused on getting it right, on investing a lot of money. They spent hundreds of millions on, uh, on developing these two products. Truly a global market, lots of sales, so it was very important for them to get it right. But they focused a lot in, at least initially, on getting the best technology. So if we look at the mechanics behind those two uh, different machines, they, f they spend a lot of energy, for instance, on how they will configure the different processing power that they have. And Sony, for instance, focused on an architecture that consisted, if I remember correctly, of eight different processors that were specialized for doing certain things, whereas Microsoft adopted a very different uh, approach. But they both focus on technology, and they spend millions. Do you know who won that battle in the beginning, Microsoft or Sony? It was Nintendo, actually. From the point of view of sales, it was Nintendo in the beginning. And it was Nintendo, a much smaller company, not as resourceful as the other two companies. And Nintendo basically used a technology that was very simple. You could find these bits and pieces around and put together. But what they got right was the, how they used this type of innovations. And they got it right by working a lot with external people and with their customers. They created an entirely new market. It also suggests this model that in order to win, we have to control our IP. If we develop a technology ourselves, yeah, I remember we're putting our hands in our pockets, we're spending money. The last thing we want is to let our competitors benefit from our technology. So again, that model focused a lot on protection. They said, OK, we need to create value through these technologies, but then we need to make sure that we not our competitors, appropriate, capture that value. Okay? That's the closed model. And here are the principles of the open model. And you can see the contrast. And you can see that some of these assumptions cannot really hold these days. Well, first, not all smart people for work for us. And secondly, external R&D can create significant value for us. 
the fact that I, have not, I haven't developed a certain technology does not necessarily mean that I cannot use that technology in order to benefit. It also means, and I was talking about this distinction yesterday, it also means that even if I develop a technological component, anything, again, it might be that other people, external people, are better able than me to use that. It doesn't mean that because I develop that specific technology that I will be in the best position to exploit it. Exploitation and the creation of technology are complementary, but again, they involve very different processes, some of which are incompatible with one another and require very different skills. So technological success or technological capability do not necessarily go hand in hand with how we exploit these, technolo these technologies. So the principle here is that we don't have to necessarily originate the research in order to uh, benefit from it. And on top of that, it adopts a very different approach to the technology. We should profit from the technology of others, but whenever we cannot use the technology ourselves, and if we look again practical examples from the industry or aggregate data from firms, they develop lots of patents every year, but many of these patents they don't use. And here the principle is that if I'm a big firm or a small firm, I'm developing a, a portfolio of patents and I use only some of them, the rest of these patents are sitting here on my desk. Rather than keeping these patents here on my desk, I will open these patents to the market and ask you, my competitors, suppliers, and so on, to try to exploit these technologies in order to find innovative ways to make something new. So very, very different types of, uh, a very different approach to innovation. But let me start giving a few practical examples as to how companies can engage in open innovation. There are very different types. Uh, and all of these things come with certain advantages and disadvantages. First, and that is probably the most controversial, but in my view also the most interesting, is to reveal their innovations. And I'm using here the example of, of Google. I should have written, reveal their innovations for free. Many of you have smartphones, and those of you who don't have an iPhone, but have, let's say, a Samsung, an LG, or a Sony smartphone, you probably know that your phone is running the Android. Okay? The Android was developed by Google. Again, that company spent hundreds of millions on the development of that operating system. It's, it's a big project. They got it right, and at the, when they first developed it, and they spent all these millions, they said, okay, now we will give it to everyone for free. And that's what they did, for free. And of course, companies like Samsung and LG and Sony then said, thanks very much. That solves half of our problem, because if I'm Samsung or LG, I can use that operating system I don't have to employ that many software engineers, and therefore I can focus on developing a new innovative device yeah, from a hard uh, point of view, but the software will be there. So they all said, thanks very much. But you know, does it make sense to spend all this money and then just reveal it for free? Well, perhaps in the beginning it doesn't make sense, but if you think about certain advantages, very often it does make sense. In the case of Google, for instance, they released the Android, and within two or three years, they managed to get over 50% of the global market. Of the global market, yeah, and that's a huge market. You cannot do that in any other way. You cannot capture 50% of the global market within two or three years. So they attracted lots of companies, but remember, if, if I develop something and I give it to you, and you start using it, and we're talking about large companies like Samsung, I still 
own it. I'm the owner. You are using what I developed, but I still own it. The fact that I'm giving it to you to use doesn't mean that you own it. I own it, and this means that I also control it. And these firms, uh, these days, even if they want to, it won't be easy to change from the Android to another operating system. For starters, they have to develop another one. And that would be a huge disruption for their product line. They, it would be near a suicide to do that. And if you cannot easily switch from one operating system to the other, it means the, uh, that you are locked in certain technology. And therefore, me as Google, who, you remember, I still own that technology, I can steer the wheel, I can steer the technological trajectory in a way that can be much more beneficial for me in the future. So, yes, it, perhaps it's, it is in one of the extreme cases, uh, but in certain cases, including the case of Google, it makes sense because it accelerates a lot the uh, especially platform technologies. And remember, platform technologies will be the bed for many other technologies, as we have now seen. In other cases, companies, and that's the second point, will not reveal their innovations for free, but they will license their innovations. A good example is IBM. Some of the units of IBM, and that's a company that, again, generates lots of patents every year, I say, these are the patents that we've got, and ask the market to exploit them for a fee, of course. Or if it's not a fee involved, they will say, okay, there are certain uh, things that we can exchange. When they don't have the capabilities to do it, they go and start acquiring firms, usually from developed countries. And again, with these acquisitions, they acquire capabilities that they don't themselves have. So you can see it's not just about an uh, inward, but also outward open innovation. In other cases, they engage in very fruitful collaborative uh, uh, agreements, uh, alliances and joint ventures, but also I'll discuss in a minute a few other forms that are more innovative. Uh, I've got here the example of Google and Luxottica, for instance, they, that, was not, that, that is not a very new alliance, but Google and Luxottica, Luxottica is a, a glass uh, firm, they got together in order to develop glasses and uh, contact lenses. It also reminds me, I, I travel to, twice to Germany every year. I, I deliver an executive course for some companies there, uh, like IBM and uh, many car companies like Audi and Porsche. Uh, but uh, there was a, a guy there from a, a German company, I, I don't remember the name of, uh, but they've got huge warehouses. And he, this guy was explaining to me what they are trying to do with this type of glasses. And uh, they tried to develop a technology that can recognize certain objects. And the idea behind is that People in the warehouse, they will wear these glasses, and when they start moving around the warehouse, these glasses will recognize certain objects and be able to tell where these, project, uh, these objects are and where they need to go. Of course, that's not easy, because whatever item I have, let's say this, to be recognized by the contact lenses or the these glasses, and then these glasses to communicate with a server, even if that technology is, you know, I wouldn't say it's radical, you know, we still have the telecommunication technology to do that. It's very, very difficult, though, to make a computer recognize this object. And it, of course, it's not about just this project, it's about multiple projects, or objects, because depending on the angle of that project, and there are so many different angles that I can uh, view it from, uh, it, it, it will change the shape, right? So even very simple objects will be very difficult to get right, and that's a lot of work. But it shows you an example of what these 
technologies can do and how open innovation can help firms that have very different capabilities. One firm in the optics, for instance, industry, another one uh, in software and uh, other capabilities to come together and produce something meaningful. Then there are also other types of collaborations. I have here two examples which I very much like. The first one is the example of Innocentive. Have you ever heard of that firm, Innocentive? It's, it's a big platform. I've got a few slides here. Their website looks like this. It's a very big platform of engineers and scientists. In international business, the first thing our students learn is that the key competitive advantage of multinational companies is that they can access different pods of scientific knowledge and scientific talent. If I'm a single location firm and I'm competing with a multiple location firm, the multiple location firm can go in India, can go in China, can go in other places and start recruiting people from there, working with these people, can access different pools of scientific knowledge and scientific talent and get all those different pools under one umbrella. If I'm a single location firm, I cannot do that. And therefore, the main competitive advantage of the multinational firm is that it can bring different resources that are often location bound uh, under one umbrella. Yep. This is a little bit the opposite. So what this company does, it has lots of engineers and scientists across countries. And if I, as a firm, would like to develop something new, I have two different approaches to it. Let's say that I, I like to develop a new screen or a new component. The typical approach, the traditional approach, would be to go to the market to start recruiting R&D scientists and employees, create a laboratory for that particular function, get these guys, lock them for a year, and hopefully after a year I'll get some results. <coughs> yep, the typical approach. But this involves the creation of an R&D lab. It involves me advertising for this kind of jobs, interviewing people, and so on. Plus, there are, of course, specific limitations that come to, uh, that depend on where I operate. Yeah, I have to find people from the locations I operate from. The alternative model would be to use that company and specify, advertise to that company, what I would like to do. Here I have an actual example. I, that's a screenshot from two or three days ago that I got. I specify here, I advertise what I would like to develop. Let me pick one in random. The last one, the long-term corrosion protection of existing hydraulic steel structures. Now, I don't know exactly what they want to do, but many other engineers and scientists would know. So advertise it. I specify the fee, 70,000. 5,000 US dollars, and then it's up to you, the market, to work or not on that project. Next slide, I, it describes more specifically what I would like to do. Of course, I set a deadline. I set specific things that I like this to have at the end, what kind of specifications. But, you know, very briefly, we can quickly have a look at it. Say, you know, how can we protect steel structures from corrosion? A very practical problem, you know, existing structures uh, for 50 or more years without significant maintenance and so on. Now, the key benefit, and that's what I like about this kind of approach, is that people across the world will read about that and start working on that. And they are free to submit at the end of, before the deadline, to submit their solution. So that's a challenge, and anyone across the world can submit a solution. At the end of the process, after the deadline, I, as a firm, if I receive, say, 10 solutions, I'll go through these solutions one by one. 
I'll pick the best. I'll pay the team or individual who came up with that idea. And then the technology will be mine. It's a very simple approach. But remember what I described earlier. One of the key advantages of using the global market is that you can get access to specific pools of knowledge from different countries. So this is a way of turning what we, in many studies, we would describe as location-bound advantages into advantages that are no longer location-bound, that the firm can access. Of course, again, if we look at practical data, actual statistics from across countries, you would see that there are very, very significant variations, A, in terms of the pool of scientific talent. Some countries have larger pools, some countries have smaller. There are significant variations in terms of division of labor across these countries. In other words, some countries are very good. They specialize in certain things, but other countries are specialized in very different things. So again, I can access people from different countries. I can bring together different uh, disciplines. But also there are significant variations, A, in the, in the level of unemployment. In certain countries, especially emerging countries, there are very good people, very smart guys who graduate from good universities. They are full of energy. They want to do things, but they don't have a job. And all of this can access platforms like this. This is only ex one example. There are many platforms like this. And, and be innovative. And on top of that, there are significant variations in terms of the cost of doing innovation. If we look at, again, the data, most of the cost of innovation is coming from employing people. It's about 60% in most industries of R&D costs are employment costs, hiring scientists and engineers. But when we look at these variations across countries, the, again, there are significant differences in terms of how much an employee will cost. I'll give you a practical example. The cost of an R&D engineer in Germany per hour is 36 US dollar e equivalent. Okay? One hour of an R&D scientist in Germany, 36 dollars. Can you guess how much an equivalent scientist in India would cost? It's 3, 3.2, 3.6. And again, you know, as a firm, I can benefit from that because 70, 75,000 US dollars will mean lots of money for some emerging countries. It might not be that much for some other countries. So again, I can exploit all these advantages that, as I said before, Usually, we consider it to be location-bound, and we ask firms to go near to these pools of knowledge in order to exploit them. I can turn these location-bound advantages into advantages that can flow internationally. Let me then, in these three minutes, very quickly go through certain opportunities and challenges. Because I presented it in a very positive way, and I am very positive about open innovation, but that it's not as easy as it seems. Of course, certain benefits will include the fact that firms that engage in open innovation will be able to manage R&D capacity problems. I don't have, as, in other words, to create a new R&D lab in order to develop something new. I can use a company like Innocentive to expand my R&D capacity for one year, and then I'm, I don't have to, uh, to occur the fixed cost of creating a new lab. I can gain access to very different scientific disciplines. And again, there are lots of disciplines out there that are needed these days to get together certain products and complement my internal research with external. But A, it's not easy to find good partners. Even when I do find good partners, these partners might have very different mindsets and very different strategic objectives. I might want to follow this technological trajectory. They might want to follow this one. 
So again, there are many incompatibilities, but for starters, it's very difficult to find good partners. Very often, partnerships end up in litigation. We know that many alliances don't work and joint ventures don't work. S secondly, integrating external technologies, again, is very, very difficult and very disruptive. So again, when it comes to integrating external technologies, it means that I will disrupt my existing processes. In some industries, that's not an option. I cannot stop producing, let's say if I'm in the smartphone industry, I cannot afford to stop producing a model year after year. Yeah, I have to do it quickly. Relying on others, as you would expect, might also weaken the capabilities of a specific firm, especially if I start over relying on others. I might distance myself from certain technologies that might be key technologies in the future. And again, it's not always clear which of these technologies might be very useful in the future or just disappear. So the million dollar question is, are the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? What is it that we know from, from the literature? As I teach uh, my students, the, uh, uh, an answer you cannot go wrong with is, it depends. So I'll say it depends. And uh, I had a grant from the British government to look at the productivity and innovation of uh, British companies and compare it with some other companies. I did a, a study on open innovation in emerging countries as well. But one of the, uh, an interesting finding there was that many of these companies, and that was a study focused on the pharmaceutical sector, many of these companies, even though they engaged in open innovation, the, the direct effect of open innovation on their performance was simply not there. In some cases, open innovation had a negative or statistically insignificant effect on firm performance. And I looked at different types of firm performance, including uh, growth and uh, profitability and so on. So then I, I would start worrying, uh, wondering, if they don't benefit from it, wh why on earth are they spending that much money? And only later I found that, well, they don't benefit from it directly. So in other words, the impact of Innova open innovation directly on firm performance was either zero or sometimes negative, but these emerging country companies benefit from the fact that open innovation improved a lot the efficiency of their own R&D in improving their performance. So even though that effect was not there, they became much better themselves in developing technologies in improving their performance. And that was a, a strong effect, and I suspect that is why they continue doing that. I also found that they, it depends on the type of collaborator, which goes back to the point I made earlier. For instance, I found that when they engaged in global open competition, they, when they had foreign collaborators, the, uh, the effects of open innovation were much more beneficial when the, than when they had domestic. Uh, but to my surprise, uh, even though in some cases uh, internal R&D was very important in capturing the benefits of open innovation, what uh, I think still cannot explain is that some of these firms don't do R&D, but still are very successful in doing stuff. And it wasn't just a case of, uh, of these companies not reporting R&D. Because when I, I talked to them, I realized they actually don't do R&D. Uh, so that's, that remains a paradox for me as well, and perhaps uh, I'll close with that as a future opportunity for research. Thank you very much.